As I, I look out on your faces, I am filled with so much love mm -hmm. and gratitude for you. I thank God for you. Mm -hmm. I thank God for your role in our church family. And I thank God for what he's going to do for you, for you, through you, to you, by you, and in you in the next years and decades ahead. Have I told you lately that I love you? <laughs> now, today we're starting this series uh, that looks at the most important style of walking, faith walking. Notice there on your outline, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 6 and 7, we're always confident because we walk by faith and not by sight. We're always confident because we walk by faith, not by sight. Uh, for the next several weeks, we're gonna look at what that means. What are the adventures in faith walking? And, and today, we're gonna look at how can I learn to walk by faith. Now, if you wanna understand how to walk by faith, um, you gotta go to Hebrews chapter 11, which is the classic chapter on faith in the Bible. It's God's hall of fame for faith heroes. Now, how important is it that you learn what we're gonna talk about for the next several weeks? How important that you learn how to walk by faith? Look at the next verse on your outline, Hebrews eleven six. Let's read it aloud together. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. The Bible says whatsoever is not a faith is sin. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. The Bible says according to your faith it will be done unto you. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. How many times did you please God today? Well, how many things did you do in faith? If you didn't do it in faith, you did not please God. Now, today, I've asked Andy and Stacy Wood uh, our next senior pastor. Let's hear it for <laughs> Pastor Andy Wood, all right? Yeah! All right. And what a week this was. Uh, you know, last Sunday we had uh, uh, class 101. Uh, Kay and I taught it here in the, in the Lake Forest Worship Center. Well over 2,000 people showed up. Andy and Stacy were on the front row. They've signed the membership covenant. They're official members of Saddleback Church now, <laughs> all right? Anyway, I asked uh, Andy and Stacy uh, to join Kay and me today in a conversation about faith walking, about what it means to live by faith, because I want you to hear their stories uh, during all the years that they were at Echo Church, 14 years. They're not novices. They're, they're not new to the, the faith walk. And the same faith that has sustained you, has sustained Kay and me, has sustained them over many, many years. And so we're gonna have a conversation. That's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna have a conversation about seven facets of faith. Faith is like a diamond. And you look at it from different angles. And I've just given you seven of those angles. Walking by faith is expressed seven ways. Now, you might write these down. Number one, walking by faith means believing when I, I don't see it. Believing when I don't see it. Hebrews 11 verse one says this, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now, you've heard the expression, um, I'll believe it when I see it. Everybody heard that, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, the opposite is actually true. I will see it when I believe it. Some things have to be believed before they can be seen. And you have to believe it in order to see it. Faith is visualizing the future in the present. Faith is seeing something in advance. Faith is imagining something before it becomes reality. Now, whether you're an architect designing a building or an artist creating some kind of new work or um, a, uh, an athlete competing to win some kind of prize, or a scientist trying to put people on the moon, doesn't matter what you're doing, you have to believe it's possible before it's ever gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Werner von Braun, who, by the way, was a Christian, 
and was the father of the modern space age. He was the, the inventor of the space rocket. Werner von Braun said this, there has never been any great achievement in history without faith. Faith is believing even before I see it. 43 years ago, in June of 1979, uh, God birthed the dream of this church, Saddleback Church, in my heart uh, in Fort Worth, Texas. Now, uh, we didn't hold our first meeting until six months later, but I believed it for six months before I saw it. Mm. I, I believe the church was birthed in my heart six months before I ever saw a visible sign of it. And faith turns dreams into reality. Andy, talk to me about that. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about purpose-driven church, and I was remembering, you've heard me say this multiple yeah. times, but I so vividly remember reading those vision statements that yeah. you wrote for this church and that we get to be benefactors of your obedience and responding to that vision. And it strikes me that, you know, you're, you're saying yes to God influenced my life, and now I'm getting to step into yeah. this. Uh, but little did I, you know. Little did I know <laughs> at 21 years old. Yeah. And uh, that inspiration became the beginning for Echo Church that we started in the Bay Area. Yeah. And when we started the conversation, you know, many of you who are on staff and in the church may remember a guy by the name of Doug Slayball, yeah. uh, who was on staff here many years ago. And he asked me, you know, how long has this kind of a vision been in your heart? And I said, well, it's, it's been in my heart since I was 21 years old. Yeah. And I said, let me, let me send you a paper that I wrote when I was 21 years old. Wow. And so I sent it over to wow. him. Uh, but our vision came in Fort Worth, Texas as yeah. well. Yeah, exactly. In a period of fasting and prayer. Um, and when God gave that vision to us, so we started taking some trips out to the Bay Area. And we knew at that point the Bay Area was the most unchurched area in all of North America. Yeah. And there was a group of people, so they had, you know, planted a church and there were some pastors and they got together. And somebody told me once, like, when you're, when you're trying to learn, you should go and you should hear from people who, you know, their churches grew, people who struggled, anybody, you can learn from everyone. Yeah. And so we got in the living room and we had this conversation and they said, well, what's your vision? And so I just started launching. You know, we, we dream of a church where people who are far from God can come and their lives can be changed. We dream of a church that's ethnically diverse. We dream of a church that reaches the next generation. And I'm just going on and on and on and on of all the things that God's put in my heart. And at the end of that, they all kind of like looked at each other and took a deep breath. And they're like, well, let me tell you some reasons why that can't happen. And so they go... <laughs> Well, the, the Bay Area is too expensive, and it's too diverse, and people are separated. They're going on and on and on. And that night, I, I went back, and I was praying, and I was like, well, God, what, well, just send us to Atlanta or Dallas or somewhere else, not the Bay Area. And um, in that moment, I had a very clear prompting from the Holy Spirit uh, and God in my mind took me to the story of Joshua and Caleb. Mm. And what I sensed is a whisper from God really became an axiom or a mantra for mm -hmm. our lives. And I felt like God was saying to me in that moment, Andy, I, I want you to be a Joshua. Mm. I want you to be a Caleb for this region. Mm. And so when we came to the Bay Area, we hadn't seen it happen yet, but we knew it was possible with God. And so often I think what happens in our minds with faith is we're so focused on ourselves rather than focused on the capacity of God. Mm -hmm. And something shifts when I, I can begin to see God, God is powerful and he has spoken so many things into existence. Yeah. And part of faith is being able to see into the future and say, God can create it, I know he can, yeah. and I'm going to start walking in that direction. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Faith is believing when I don't see it. Believing when I don't see it. And you let, as Andy just said, you let the size of your God determine the size of your goal. Number two. Second thing walking in faith means. Walking in faith means obeying God when I don't understand it. Now it's easy to obey God when you do understand it and it makes sense. But faith is obeying God when I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. In Hebrews chapter 11, uh, God gives us three examples. Uh, Noah. Uh, Abraham and uh, the children of Israel who were believing in, when they didn't see it and who were obeying when they, when they didn't understand it, okay? Look at these verses. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7 says this. 
by faith, it was by faith, that Noah built an ark to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about something that had never happened before. Most people don't realize that before there was a flood, the Bible says it had never rained on earth. So when God says it's gonna flood, Noah's going, what's a flood? <laughs> it had never rained on earth. The Bible tells us a mist came up from the ground. Now, what if God told you, I'm gonna send a flood, which you've never seen, and I'm gonna fill the world with water, and I'm gonna start all over with you. Would you believe that? <laughs> Would you believe that? Imagine Noah's questions and his doubts. It didn't make sense because it had never rained. Mm -hmm. But Noah obeyed without question. And guess what? We're all here because of that one man's faith. Yeah, it's good. If Noah hadn't had faith, none of us would be breathing right now. Mm -hmm. Second example in Hebrews 11, Abraham. In verse eight, it says this, Hebrews 11, eight. It was faith that made Abraham obey. Noah obeyed. Abraham obeyed when God called him to go out to a country that God had promised. He left his own country without knowing where he was going. Now, here's the reason why this is a big jump of faith. Abraham was 75 years old. He's not some spring chicken. In fact, he was quite wealthy. And he was going to have to move all of his family, all of his flocks, his crops, his relatives, all the people that hang on. Abraham was 75 years old when the adventure of faith walking began for that guy. You're never too old to start faith walking. And, and uh, he didn't complain and he didn't delay. He just packed everything up. When he was getting ready for social security. Guy said, get ready for social insecurity. <laughs> and, and, and what took faith was that God, what took faith was that God didn't tell him any of the details. Abraham goes, where am I headed? Trust me. How long will it take to get there? Trust me. How am I gonna know when I'm there? I'll tell you. Trust me. Now the result is, because he obeyed, just like Noah obeyed, and we're all here, Abraham obeyed, he became the father of the nation of Israel. Obedience often involves risking. And a third example of that in Hebrews 11 is um, the Israelites leaving slavery in Egypt. And in verse 29, it says this. By faith, the people walked, circle that word walk, we're talking about faith walk. By faith, the people walked through the Red Sea like they were walking on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to do it, they drowned. Now, that's real faith walking. Listen, everybody. Anytime God asks you to do something, it is always a test of faith. Yep. Every time God asks you to do anything, he's saying, are you going to believe your feelings or are you going to believe me? Are you going to believe what I tell you or are you going to believe what the world tells you? Are you going to be my promises or are you going to believe your fears? Mm. Who am I going to trust? God or my feelings. Do you guys remember as a kid, your parents uh, sometimes insisted that you do something that made no sense to you? Anybody remember that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It was a test of your trust in your parents. They said, do it. And you go, why? Why? Because I what? Said so. Said so. Say so. They didn't explain it. It's just, I'm your parent and you will do what I say. God doesn't owe you an explanation for everything he tells you to do. God often asks us to do the impossible. He often asks us to stretch our faith and sometimes asks us to, God, God asks us to do something. It doesn't make sense. But if you obey, you will be blessed. On the other hand, if you disobey, you know what happens? You miss all the blessings of God. Yeah. I shudder to think the blessings I would have missed if I hadn't obeyed God, if Kay hadn't obeyed God. I shudder to think about getting to heaven and seeing the things I could have had if I had obeyed God and hadn't disobeyed him. Guys, let's talk about this, okay? Yeah. Stacy, you want to start? Sure, sure. I think that for me, this, this whole journey of saying yes to coming to Saddleback has been 
an act of trust mm. and obedience. Mm. Um, sometimes you think you're right in the middle of God's plan for you and his will and you're being obedient. And then suddenly there's this huge change of direction, a, a, <laughs> a detour in the path. And, and man, the, the thing I want most out of my life is to obey God and to trust God. But I, I thought I knew what that looked like for the next 40 years of my life. And we were in the Bay Area and we, we thought that that's where God wanted us to give our whole lives, to see a church planting movement there. And we still deeply care about the Bay Area. But it, in, in March, it started to become clear that maybe God was doing something different. And I did not understand at all. Like, why? Why would you want to, to redirect us like this? Like, we have such a, a strong mission here. Mm. And, and it was so confusing to me. And it was such a, a painful act of surrender of what I thought my future was going to look like. But I, I just, I was clinging to that, that some of the old hymns, I grew up in a Southern Baptist pastor's house. And so I'm used to some of those old hymns and that, that hymn, Trust and Obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, yeah. but to trust and obey. Hmm. And I knew, like I knew if this was the act of obedience, if this was the act of surrender, then this was going to be the path of, of happiness and joy. And, and even if I tried to stay in that old path, living in obedience, what I thought looked like obedience, that that wasn't gonna be the path of joy that God intended for my life because hmm. true joy is found when we trust and when we obey, even when it doesn't make sense to us. And, and we don't have to, like, like Pastor Rick said, we don't have to fully understand. He doesn't owe us an explanation, but we just take that step and, and one step at a time, his word is a, a lamp to our feet. And we just keep walking. And that's where we find peace. And that's where we find joy. Even, even in the grief, even in the hard times. It's, um, it's in that obedience and that trust that we can, can experience the, the peace and the favor of God over our lives. Mm. Good. Mm. Katie, talk about that. Well, I was... I was just, well, two things I was thinking, but I was also reminded, Stacy, how you have talked, I've heard you talk about um, Mary, the mother yeah. of Jesus, is so significant to you mm -hmm. as a model of surrender. Mm -hmm. I loved that, um, that I, I heard that song recently again, and when I did, it makes me think of you, mm -hmm. because you tell so poignantly how Mary's faith mm -hmm. inspired you right. at many points in your life, but particularly around this decision. Right. Just Yeah, so... You guys know the story where the, the uh, Gabriel, the angel, came to Mary and just like interrupted her life. And she thought she knew what her life was going to look like growing up in Nazareth as a young Jewish girl. And, and Gabriel just intersected her life that day and said, actually, this is the plan God has for you. And in some ways, we look at that and we're like, wow, that's so amazing. You are the one woman in the world that got to be the mother of the Messiah. How cool <laughs> is that? But in another way, that's a really hard calling. And that just completely interrupted and, and disrupted the plans that she had envisioned for herself. And I, what spoke to me so much in that passage was just her response back to Gabriel in that moment that she just said, I am the Lord's servant. May it be unto me as you have said. And I feel like when, when you're a Christian, when you're really trying to pursue God, that, that has to be our posture. Like, whatever you say, may it be unto me as you have said. I'll, I'll trust you. You're worthy of my trust. When I first heard you tell that story, it resonated with me so much because Mary has been so significant for me in yeah. my own journey of surrender. Um, I can think of a couple of times when, you know, the very first... Hey, hang on a minute. I asked Kay one time, can you think of a time when you obeyed God and it didn't make sense? And she said... When you asked me to marry you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the honest uh. truth. 
That's the honest truth. And that is what I was getting ready to say. I know you were. So. Uh, because I wasn't in love with him. Yeah. I liked him. He was really nice and he was really cute and all that stuff. <laughs> but I wasn't in oh, love with him. Oh, tell me more. Him. <laughs> and um, but when he, we'd only gone out on one date, many of you have heard this. We'd right. only gone out on one date, and we had been we were college. We'd gone to the same college, and so we kind of knew each other, but sort of. Yeah. But then he asked me out. We go out one time. Eight days later, he asks me to marry him before our second date. Yeah, and and I just remember praying and saying it was the very first time in my entire life that I remember that it was a moment first of all it was pure panic <laughs> and, um, and kind of just shoot up this prayer of what am I supposed to say to this very earnest young man who's telling me he wants me to marry him um, and, I, and God said say yes and I'll bring the feelings and, and at 19 in my you know incredibly mature understanding of life and God's will and marriage and love I said I said yes so I said yes to him and then trusted that God would bring the feelings because I didn't have them. I wasn't, it wasn't like the movie, you know, with the bells ringing and, and the, you know, I don't know, the angels tapping you on the shoulder, whatever. None of that happened. But I had heard distinctly God say yes, and it did not make sense. So practicing that yes, of course, it's turned out really well 47 years later, but... <laughs> But it was a huge test for me yeah. of obeying when I did not understand. The other time that I started to say that reminded me when you were talking about Mary was that when God called me to become an advocate for people with HIV and AIDS and for orphans and vulnerable children in 2003, yeah. it simply yeah. didn't make sense. I'm a yeah. white suburban mom and a min with a minivan. Um, I have no medical degree, no medical knowledge. What do I know about this global illness? What do I know about millions of, of orphans and vulnerable children? Nothing. Yeah. And it just didn't make sense. But again, that was the second time in my life in which it was so clear that God was calling, God was moving, interrupting, and it was Mary, the mother of Jesus, her example of surrender that gave me the courage to say yes to God in yet another time of not understanding. Mm -hmm. So when you told me your story, it was like, oh, I love you. I love, <laughs> I, love I love that we both love Mary. That's so yes. cool. Back to you. Well, the point is, is that if you don't obey when God tells you to do something that doesn't make sense, you're going to miss out a huge blessing like marrying Rick Warren. That's right. That's right. You know. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Walking by faith means believing when I can't see it. It means obeying when I don't understand it. Number three, walking by faith means persisting when I don't feel like it. Yeah. Persisting when I don't feel like it. You know, our culture is so emotion-based today. Everything is done by your feelings. If I feel it, I do it. If I don't feel it, I don't do it. Uh, if it feels good, do it. Base your life on your feelings. Live by your emotion. If it feels good, do it. The problem with that philosophy is that feelings are highly unreliable. Feelings lie. You lie to yourself more than you lie to anybody else. The Bible says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. That means I lie to myself more than I lie to anybody else in life. But the result is if you live by your feelings, you're going to be manipulated by your moods the rest of your life. Mm. Now I'm going to do a little true confession here. I don't always feel like being nice to people. <laughs> I don't always feel like hugging people. I don't always feel like being unselfish. I don't always feel like helping my wife and kids. Don't say anything, babe. <laughs> and this is going to really shock you. I don't always feel like reading my Bible and praying. What I've discovered is that if the only time I pray is when I feel like it, the devil makes sure I never feel like it. If the only time I read my Bible is when I feel like it, the devil makes sure I never feel like it. Great people are just ordinary people who persist in doing things that other people don't feel like doing. Yep. For the last 43 years of pastor, much of that time I was doing things I didn't feel like doing. Mm. There were mornings I didn't want to come to church and preach. I wanted to stay home and watch football. <laughs> and much of my 
52 years in ministry, I was doing things I didn't particularly feel like doing at that time. It was just the right thing to do. It's always the right time to forgive. It's always the right time to love. It's always the right time to be kind. Olympic athletes will spend hours and hours exercising. Do you think they always feel like doing that? Of course not. Master musicians spend hours of hours practicing to become proficient in, in, uh, in their instrument. Do you think they always feel like doing it? No. Godly men and godly women do what isn't always fun to do. Right. They're willing to do what other people don't do because they never feel like it. Mm -hmm. Faith is being persistent. That means refusing to give up, keeping on, keeping on, enduring, being diligent, being determined. Faith is keeping on, keeping on, being persistent, even when you're tired. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how do you develop that kind of persistence? Because that's what it means mm -hmm. to walk by faith. Well, the Bible says this. Hebrews 11, 27. It was by faith that Moses left Egypt, you know, not fearing, not afraid of the king's anger. Pharaoh was ticked off. He wanted to kill Moses. But faith, Moses left Egypt, not afraid of the king's anger. In other words, feelings are involved there. He held to his purpose, he's purpose-driven, like a man <laughs> who could see the invisible. Now, the key to persistence is that last phrase. He saw the invisible. Persistence happens when you focus on what is not seen. Mm. You can't see it. Today, you may look at your marriage and you don't like what you see. You may look at your health and not like what you see. You may look at your family and not like what you see. Your job, your dream, whatever, and not like what you see. But you're, you, you don't give up because faith is persistent even when you don't feel like it. Mm -hmm. If you feel like giving up on your marriage, if you feel like giving up on your business, if you feel like giving up your dream, hang on, keep on trusting, don't stop believing. Yeah. Sounds like a great tune. Somebody should write a song. Don't stop believing. God will make a way if you trust him. Now notice this verse, Hebrews 11, verse one. What is faith? It is the confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. We went 13 years without land in this church, and the church grew from 500 to 1,000 to 2,000 to 3,000 to 4,000 to 5,000 to 6,000 to 8 to 9 to 10,000. We were running over 10,000 people before we built this building. We went 13 years using 79 different rented facilities. We were the church, if you can figure out where we are this week, you get to come. That was not fun. Setting up and taking down a church every single week for 13 years, there's no glory in it, folks. It's just not fun. But faith is persistent even when you don't feel like it. And, it, and when, you, when you know that it is going to happen, then you become persistent. Let's talk about persistence for a minute, guys. Yeah. Yeah, Who wants to go first? I would say a couple things that have been super helpful for me uh, when I think about persistence. I like to play the movie in the future. And so I have several different images in my mind. One of them is walking my daughter down the aisle. Oh. Um, I have the image of being married for 40 years with kids and grandkids around. And then ultimately the, the image that for me most helps me persist as I think about that moment when I'll see Jesus face to face. Mm -hmm. And the thought that I'll, number one, give an account for my life, what did I say with salvation, but what did I do with the life he gave me, and did I persist in that? Mm -hmm. It reminds me, uh, there was a moment, we were about seven years into the church plant, and I, I don't know if this ever happens at Saddleback, but when we were there, there were people that would leave the church from time to time. No. Yeah, it's never and happened. Never I, happened. I don't know. There. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah. So um, everybody that's ever come to Saddleback stays, but there we every <laughs> once in a while would have people leave. And it was one of those years, lots of people had left the church. Uh, we were going through a really difficult time at home. Mm -hmm. uh, we were sitting on the couch watching Netflix, eating dark chocolate. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we, at the same time, we had had several of our really good friends who this, one of the spouses had left. Oh. And it was one of those moments, it was really hard in all areas. 
and Stacy were sitting there and she said, um, sometimes I, I fear that you'll leave me. Mm. And I looked at her and I said, if I leave, I'm taking you. Like there's, there's no, <laughs> I'm not going anywhere without you, number one. Uh, but also, where else would I go? Where else would I go? And I think about Peter's words to Jesus. Right. When everybody else is leaving and Jesus looks at Peter and says, are you going to go too? And Peter says, where, where else would I go? And so I think tethering persistence to the cross in what Jesus did for me, mm -hmm. that there, there is no other place to go yeah. other than to write with him. Right. And those, Stuck with those us, Lord. images yeah. help me persist when it's, when it's really hard. Mm -hmm. it's really yeah, hard. can I add to that? Yeah. So I think I'm kind of thinking of that same season, but can we just talk about parenting in general for a minute? <laughs> and that's hard to persist through. I, I don't know what I was expecting but not this. And can I, can I just be honest? I mean, it was, it was different than in my head. She had, she had um, unrealistic expectations with parenting, but really low expectations with marriage, and they were all exceeded. So it's great. So it's I, the opposite. I knew I had set, set myself up for disappointment when my, my oldest son was about one, and I could see willful disobedience for the first time. And I was so brokenhearted that he would do something to disobey his mommy. Like I was, <laughs> what, why would you do that? But anyway, so it's been a long journey for me with parenting and realizing that that happens. And um, I think that with parenting in general, there have just been, there's no manual for parenting and you keep, thinking, what am I doing? I don't know what I'm doing. Like every single day I, I face a new situation and I think I, by this point I should know. I should know what to do in this moment, but I still don't know what to do in this moment. And I, I think parenting feels like that a lot. And when I talk to other moms, they're all experiencing these same feelings. And bless your heart, if you have a perfect little family and your children love you and obey you. Aren't they always the ones that do the parent seminars too? God they're bless you. <laughs> yes. That's not the rest of us. And, and so we're just trying to get, it, get through it. And there have been times of deep discouragement where we've just been going through a really challenging season in our home life. And... Sometimes Andy will want to give up or sometimes I'll want to give up and just kind of let my heart grow hard and disengage and like let it become very transactional. And, um, and one of us will just say to the other, but that's not actually what you want. That's, you have to keep fighting for that, for their heart and for that thing that you want more than you want to give up right now. And so I think like Andy was saying, you know, at the cross, like it was for the joy set before him that Jesus endured the cross. And so having that greater vision of this is the kind of relationship I want with my kid when they're 30 years old. I don't want all this hurt from our past. I'm gonna endure, I'm gonna persevere because I have my eyes set on something bigger than this moment. And that has helped me persevere in, really good. through parenting. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Don't you love these guys? Yeah. yeah, wow, fantastic. Katie? Oh, well, I was just, I wanted to give you a word of encouragement, Stacy, <laughs> because I have a 43-year-old and a 41-year-old, and half the time I still don't know what to do. <laughs> and they're great. Yeah. They're great. But I don't know that we ever get that mm -hmm. proficiency that right. we long for. Right. It seems like we should have we it. Should have it. Like, it yeah, should it should be downloaded into I us the it. moment you become a mom. I just, just want just, you to know, know that you learn a little bit, but it just never... I don't know. Right. Parenting is always a struggle. Mm -hmm. It's always a sacrifice. It's always an exercise in trust. Any other parents <laughs> know that story? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> you love your kids with all your heart, and, and, it's, and it's work, and you're always trying to figure something out. Yeah. Yes. Um, I would, you know, you were talking about parenting. You were talking about giving up, and, um, and, and you and I have talked about this. For me, I live with low levels of depression, and I, I have for as long as, as I can remember. And and um, there have just been some times when um, that depression just gets really old. Mm. It just gets really old. It's like having a nagging headache, you know, that never really completely goes away. And that can get discouraging. But I think 
that for me also being um, a, a recovering perfectionist, um, I'm not recovered, I am recovering, <laughs> um, but sometimes I get really discouraged at how far I have yet to go uh, when I discover that I'm, you know, one of my blind spots gets revealed either in, in my relationship with you or with our kids or with my friends or somebody that I really love and, and, and one of my blind spots comes to the surface and I realize, well, I'm just not nearly as nice as I really think I am, or I'm not as kind as I like to think of myself, or I'm not as far down the road in my Christian maturity, and I can just get so discouraged about that. I was telling these guys earlier today, I really have genuinely had these moments in which I've just said, well, fooey, I'll just, I'll just be a pagan for a while. <laughs> <laughs> that I want to see. Uh, I said it would probably... My wife, the pagan. Uh, yeah, well, I don't even know what that means, but, I, but I'd probably last 15 minutes and then just go, well, you see, I can't even be a good pagan. I don't know. Um, but, but there does come those moments, particularly if your personality or whatever leans toward more of that Eeyore scale, you know, and the Winnie the Pooh scale of things, mm. if you're on that Eeyore type thing, to persist, to keep going. I love what you're talking about, tethering, finding things that tether you, finding things that anchor you, finding, taking that long view and that hopeful, um, persisting when I don't feel like it is, is um, a real test of faith. Okay. If you've been to any of the PDC conferences, you know that I've told pastors for decades when they ask me, have you ever felt like giving up? And I say, just every Monday morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Every Monday morning, I get PMS, <laughs> post-message syndrome. Mm -hmm. It gets really crabby, too. <laughs> and I don't believe in God before 11 a.m. on Monday. <laughs> when you've given out and given out three, four, five, six services, you, you have nothing left. And you're, you, ver, is, the Bible says about Jesus, virtue goes out of you. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and yet you just keep on keeping on. Most of my ministry... I did in pain. Usually behind every public success, you're gonna find private pain in some area, yep. some kind of area. It may be physical ailments, thorns in the flesh, uh, it may be emotional issues or relational issues. You're gonna find private pain behind every public success. All right, let's go to number four. Walking by faith means announcing in advance before I have it announcing in advance before I have it. You state a goal in advance. Every time you make a goal, you're basically saying, I believe God wants us to do this by such and such a time. That's a statement. Every goal is a statement of faith. Sometimes you have to say it with your mouth before you sense it. You have to state it. The Bible tells us that God called the world into existence. Hebrews 11:22 says this. It was by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, confidently spoke, circle that, confidently spoke. You say it before you see it, before you sense it. Confidently spoke of God bringing his people out of Egypt. He was so sure of it that he had commanded them to carry his bones with them when he left. He said, you're gonna go back home one day, guys. You're not gonna stay in Egypt forever. And when you go back home, take my bones with you now, the Bible repeatedly makes a direct connection between your words and your faith. Are you speaking words of faith or words of fear? Are you speaking words of faith or words of failure? You're always talking. Out of the mouth, the heart speaks. You make a direct connection between our words and our faith, between what we say and what we receive from God by faith. The Bible says over and over again, remember when we went through the book of James, our words have tremendous power when stated in faith. You know, at the very first uh, uh, prelim service, preliminary service of Saddleback Church, I stood up, there were about 60 people in the, in the dress rehearsal service, and I said, this church already has 50 acres uh, for our campus. We just don't see it yet. You know what the problem with that vision was? I stated it in faith. I stated it before I saw it. We've got 50 acres. I just don't see it yet. The problem was God wanted to give us three times that amount. Mm -hmm. Oh, ye of little faith. God eventually gave us almost three times that size. Sometimes speaking in faith requires you to look foolish to everybody else because you make a statement, people go, there's no way that's gonna happen. Like you were talking about when you were getting ready to start Echo. 
There's no way that's going to happen. People are telling you there will always be dream busters, there will always be naysayers, there will always be critics uh, in your life. But God just says it anyway, whether anybody believes it or not. God changed Abram's name to Abraham, which he went, Abraham means father of a great nation, and he changed his name before he had any kids. He's 99 years old now. God has changed his name to father of a great nation, and he has no babies. He walks into a bar and says, what's your name? Father of a great nation. Oh, how many kids you got? None. How old are you? 99. That would be embarrassing. Romans 4, 17, look at this verse uh, on your outline. God announced to Abraham, I have made you the father of many nations. So Abraham believed the God who gives life to the dead and circle this, calls things that are not as though they were. I've done that all my life and been criticized constantly for it. Calls things that are not as though they were. It is speaking things into existence. Almost every major goal we had in this, ch in this church, I announced it, I believed it, I said it, I expected it, and I acted like it was already here before it was already here. Calling things that are not as though they were. Now there's a lot more I could say about this point, but I wanna go on. I'll, I'll talk to you about it in another message. Well, wow, hasn't this been rich, and we're only halfway through this message. There's another half to it. And so what we've decided to do is we're gonna cut this in half and share the second half next week because I just didn't want you to miss any of the content. This has been good and the second half is good. I want you to invite your friends to come next week. Watch the first half online. But I wanna end today uh, by saying two things. First, if you haven't been baptized, we're having one last baptism that I'm doing this Wednesday uh, at 4 p.m. here at the Lake Forest campus. It's not too late for you to sign up. We had a huge baptism this last week and I wanna encourage you to be baptized at that. Second, bring somebody with you to part two in our series on the, uh, the faith walk. walk. Walking by faith, the adventures of walking by faith. Uh, let me end today by just praying for you. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us and thank you that we don't live by works, otherwise we'd never make it. We live by faith, faith in your grace. Thank you that grace is the fact you know every mistake we're gonna make in life and you still chose us. And thank you for these truths out of uh, Hebrews 13 to teach us how to live by faith. We look forward to part two next week. And I pray that as we leave today, we'll go realizing that it's believing uh, what we can't see and, and that it's trusting in you when we don't know the way. All of these things we've looked at, these first four points, uh, we pray that you said we will bring glory to your name, that you are pleased when we live by faith. May we live by faith this week. And I pray this blessing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. I love you guys, have a great week.